the side of the truck across the street. But all right, cool. All right, so we are talking about. So we've looked at um, dangling references, and we're looking at memory errors and semantic errors. Um, and so we looked at dangling references, and we saw that this code, right, the value of what this dang variable points to actually changes, and it changes depending on actually the system that we're using. Uh, so we'll see kind of why that is later, because it is pretty cool. Um, so let's look at a different example. So here we have our main program again. We have a local variable called dang, a local variable called foo. All right, so what are the variables that are going to be so where are dang and foo allocated? Stack. So dang is going to be on the stack and foo. Stack. All right, cool. And how do we know that? They're local variables of function main, right? So all local variables are stored on the stack. Awesome. And then we're allocating, we're calling malloc to allocate a new integer, right? So now, so what is malloc going to do? Uh, allocate memory on the heap. Yeah, so it's going to do a heap allocation for us, right? It's going to create a new location on the heap. The return value of malloc is going to be the address of this new location. And we're going to copy that address and put it into the value inside the location associated with the dang, which is on the stack. So that's going to be copied in there. Then we're going to set foo equal to dang. Right? We can do that. So what's this going to do? What are the semantics of this statement going to be? Sorry. It's going to copy the uh, value associated with the location dang into the, the location associated with foo. Yes. So copy the value in the location associated with dang to the value in the location associated with foo. Right? So what's inside dang right now? What's that value inside dang? The address. The address that, which address? The address that malloc returned. Yes, the address that malloc returned, right? So we're copying that address and copying it into the value associated with foo, and then we're going to set star foo <laughs> equals to 100. So what is star foo reference? Now the hump, the address. What is star, <laughs> what does the dereference operator always return? Uh, an address. An address. L value or R value? What's that? An L value or an R value? the different types of answers. Actually, I think I've heard three answers. L. L? So who says it's an L value? Who says it's an R value? Well, how can you tell just from the, so A, is this, is this assignment statement valid? Yes. 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 So if this assignment <coughs> statement is semantically valid, what does that mean? Can you have an R value equals an R value? Can you ever have an R value on the left hand side of an equation? No. Is this where L value gets its name from? Yes. Yes, yes left. You can only use it on the left side of an, an assignment statement. So star foo returns an L value, right, which is a location, right? So dereferences always return the location, not the value, right? How you use that location, maybe how you use it, you get the value from that, right? So here we're taking 100, and where are we storing 100? in the location associated with star foo. And so star foo is taking the address inside foo and finding the box that's associated with that. And so that's that location. So we're copying 100, the R value 100, and putting it in there. Uh, in the address of foo. What? In the address of foo. No, in where foo points to. What, what is, there's an, using the value inside foo, find a location that has that address which is going to be the thing that was returned by malloc, and then copy 100 into there. 
It's always free foo. So what does the free function do? <coughs> yeah, deallocates the memory, right? So, we, so it's going to look up foo and it's going to say, okay, whatever the address is inside foo, this box now goes away. It's no longer valid. So then what happens to Dang? What's the value inside the location associated with Dang? The same address. It's the same address, which was the address returned by Foo. So what happens when we print out this dereference? You should get an error. Should get an error. We want it to get an error. Right? So yeah, the address inside Dang no longer has been allocated, right? It's been explicitly deallocated through Foo. So after this line, what are Foo and Dang? After this line, oh. right before the free. <laughs> what was that? Aliases. aliases. Yeah, they're aliases, right? They both refer to the same box, right? Foo and Dang are two different ways to reference that same box, which was the return of malloc. So when we use one of them, like Foo, to free that, now when we try to dereference Dang, right? Now Dang is now pointing to a box that doesn't exist. And so, but, anyone guess what's this going to print out? Zero, three, twelve, a hundred. <coughs> All right, it's going to print out maybe something, and assuming it continues, then we can malloc, uh, so we're, now we're going to malloc a new, right? So malloc is going to create a new box for us, and the address of that box it's going to put into foo. And then we're going to set that newly malloc location, we're going to set that equal to 42. And then we're going to free foo. And we're going to print out dang again. So what's dang going to output? What's this program going to output? Could output 42. Could output 42? Yeah. Could still output 100. It could also still output 100? Yeah, let's see. Right. But one of the keys is there's a uh, dangling reference, right? Dang is a dangling reference. So really, the output here is, could be anything, exactly. So we can compile this, and actually this program will, on our version of GCC, will not give you any warnings when you compile it. It will completely uh, work 100% fine. Then when we run this, uh, so it's gonna first output zero, and then output zero again. Interesting. Mm. So that's on GCC. Huh. And then on the Mac, on uh, the Mac, compiling this gives no errors. Uh, running this outputs 10 and 142. Right. So it's actually kind of interesting because it depends on the exact allocation library that you're using and what it's doing. But here we can see that it's actually when you, the second call to malloc, what's the address that gets returned here? The original. The same as the one that was freed, yeah, in the original malloc, right? Because that's the value, the value of the original malloc is what's inside the day. And so the call to second malloc actually returns the same address, right? And so we get really crazy results here um, from these dangling references. Okay. So. Let's look at one more example. So we're here in main, and then we enter a new scope, right? Scoping rules. So inside the main scope of main, there's an int pointer A declared, and then inside that scope, we have an int star B declared, and then we are mallocking a new integer, assigning it to A. Right, malloking another new integer, assigning it to B. So this means that we can call these addresses address one and address two. That's what we're going for here. Then we dereference A, so we set the uh, the value inside the box that the first at memory one. We're setting that to be forty-two. Then we are uh, malloking a new integer and setting it to B. And then we set star B is equal to star A. 
So what's this going to do? He gets the address of <coughs> Gets the value. He's pointing to A's address. B's getting the value. B gets the value of A. So what's the, what's going to be inside the box B? 42. Yeah. Address. Mm, an address. Yeah, that's a trick question. Three. Three is going to be inside B. So, but what's going to be inside the box three? 42. 42. 42, right? So it's going to dereference A, which is going to look at memory address one, the box associated with memory address one. It's going to grab that value in there, 42. It's going to copy it to memory address three. All right. Let me say Q. So Q is a int star star here at the top. We're going to say Q is equal to the address of A. Right? So whatever the address of A is, we're going to copy it into Q. So what kind of memory problems do we have at this point? What kind of semantic? A leak. We have a leak? Or what else have we been calling that? I don't know. Garbage. Garbage. Yeah, we have a garbage. So which memory address is garbage at this point? Memory 2. two. Memory 2, right? So we've allocated memory 2. There's absolutely no way of using the variables that we have in scope at this point that we can reference memory 2. Right? Because A has memory address 1 and Q has the address of A. All right. Then when we get out here, so what happens here when we leave this scope? Correct. So what happens to the variables? Like how does the the, the memory what changes memory wise or allocation wise? B would be the allocated. Yeah. What would be? B. B. Yeah. So because we're leaving the scope, B is automatically so B is stack allocated, right? So after we leave this scope, B is automatically deallocated. But memory two and three are not. Correct. Memories one, two, and three are not, right? Because they're heap allocated. Yeah. Yes. So using the variables at this point, so what variables do we have at this point? A, B, and A star, B star. At the very top, Q, right? We have Q, A, and B. So using Q, A, and B, and dereferences, can you ever reach memory two? Uh, no, even before, right here. Right, so what's inside B? Three, right? The value three, which is the address three. And what's inside A? One, right from this. One is going to be inside A. Three is inside B. At this point, Q has the address of A. Right? So if you dereference Q, you'll get to A. If you dereference A, you'll get to memory address 1. If you take B, you dereference B, you get to memory address 3. So is that just because like the most recent, most recent one for B is memory 3? Like most recent dec dec declaration? Exactly. At this point, right, at point 1, there is no garbage. Right? We can access both memory 1 and memory 2. But now at this point, Actually, at this point right here, we now no longer can access memory 2. So at this point, memory 2 is garbage. So now, <coughs> what about here? So now we've deallocated, automatically deallocated B. So what are the variables that we have available here? A and Q. A and Q. A and Q. So then what memory is garbage, or is garbage here? 2 and 3. 2 and 3? Yeah, so we can't access two or three, right? What about here when main ends? Q. A through Q. Ah, but there is no A anymore. Well, you can access the memory that was associated with A through Q still. So what would that be for Q? What would we call that if we can access a memory address, but that memory address is no longer allocated? Dangling reference, right? 
So at this point, Q would be the thing we reference, and we'd still have three garbage memory addresses, right? One, two, and three. Um, right. I guess if we, if you assume that this isn't actually main and it's actually was called by something else or something else happens, uh, you can actually in your own program call main again. So main doesn't necessarily have to be the top level function. Okay. Cool. So now we looked at uh, memory semantics. Now we're going to look at assignment semantics. So we've been looking at so far copy semantics, right? Which when we see an assignment statement, we know exactly how to interpret that, right? So when we see A equals B, what does this mean in the semantics that we've been using so far? Copy value of B into A. Longer. Close. Copy the value of B into the value of A. Uh, what's the value of B? How do we know the value of B? Like in the circle box diagram. So yeah, we're copying, right? But we're being like incredibly precise because we wanted to find the semantics so that everybody knows exactly what we mean. Copy the value of the address of B. Well, B is not an address. B is a variable. It holds a value. So we copy it the may hold the value. Yeah, it's close. Yeah. Um, I don't know. B said that type here. Copy the value of the address of A to right of the location that holds. Yes, locations, right? We want to talk about locations. Yeah, not, yeah, not address. So the location that holds the value of A to the location that holds the value of B, right? Backwards. Yeah. Flip it. That's right. Copying B to A? To B. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. yes. So copy the value in the location associated with B to the value in the location associated with A, <laughs> right? So very verbose, but that way we know exactly what we mean, right? When we see this copy assi assignment, this is exactly what we mean. But Crazy enough, this isn't, you know, this is one of those things we take for granted because we've been programming for a long time, right? And this is how uh, we do assignment statements, right? But these aren't the only way. And um, really, it can help to think about different ways that you could do this, right? So in some languages, you can do what's called sharing semantics, which instead of copying the value, basically means when you have A equals B, Instead of copying values, what you're going to do is change the binding associated with A to now be bound to the location associated with B. So this would be bind the name B to the location associated with A. Sorry, I think I said that backwards. Right, so in this case, you're actually changing the bindings between, right, and the binding was the arrow between a variable and a box. So now we're actually changing that binding. Yeah. Doesn't that just make them aliases? It does definitely make some aliases, yes. Cool, so let's look at this. So, um, so let's say we have some object A, right? So this is going to create a variable A, and we have some object B, and this is going to create some variable B, right? But in sharing semantics, these don't automatically create a location associated with them until we actually allocate some new memory. So here, we're saying, OK, A is now bound to this new object. So we have the new is creating a new object. And so now we have a new box. And we're binding A to that new box. And on the next line, we're binding B to some new object. And then we say A is equal to some new object. Right? Instead of copying the address in there and everything, now we're creating, we're going to create a new box. And we're going to bind A to that new box. Then when I set B equals to A in sharing semantics, what's going to happen? He's now going to, the arrow between B and the box is going to move to the box that. Yeah, so this arrow is going to move here, right? So B and A are going to both refer to that same object. Right? Does this kind of look familiar? Is this C code? No. No? Java. Java, yeah. So Java actually has, mm, it's not, it gets a little wonky, but it has a form of sharing semantics, right? Where you 
Um, so there's kind of two ways to think about it. The, I don't know, more systems level way, I guess, is to think that, well, in Java, all the objects are actually, that's a pointer to an object, right? And then basically everything except for primitive values are <laughs> pointers. And so when you set D equals to A, you're just changing the pointers. But in Java, you can never actually access the pointers directly. So the other way to think about it is think about it with sharing semantics here to say that, okay, when I declare an object A or an object B, I'm just defining a name, but that name has no location yet until you allocate a new object and assign it there. Cool. Questions? All right. We haven't got there yet, so it would not be online. Cool. So, do you love type systems? Do you hate them? What are your feelings at this point? They're great until you try to convert from one to the other. They're great until you try to convert from one to the other. Anybody else? Love them, hate them? Do you wish they weren't didn't exist? Maybe not that far. It's just sometimes it gets very annoying when uh, you're elbow deep in someone else's code and you're trying to figure out what the heck needs to be passed to get the full function to work. Uh, yeah, so it can make using other people's code more difficult. Is anybody programmed in a language that doesn't, well, all languages have types, right? But um, like a language like Python or JavaScript where you don't have to declare types. Yeah. So do you think it's good, better, worse? No. Was it? Yeah. It, sucks. it sucks. It's it's nice when you use it correctly, but it will allow you to shoot yourself in the foot like you would not do it. <laughs> yes. So you can shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah. So let. So what is? What is a type, and why do we use types? Sorry. Why do we even, why did somebody create this and why did everybody else think, yeah, this is a good idea? Or why do you think that's a good idea when you're writing, you know, compared to JavaScript or Python, right? You don't have to declare types in advance and the compiler doesn't do any checking of types. But why? Yeah. Well, they can get some way to, like, you have two objects and you didn't know if, you, can, you only want to be able to say one object is the same as another object if they're the same type. So you need some way to identify that. tell the computer how to interpret something. So like if you have 100 written out in ASCII, it will be three bytes total and it will be interpreted with whatever the ASCII code is for one, zero, and zero. Versus if you have an int 100, it will be, I don't want to do the math, but one, one, zero, zero, something like that. Right, interesting. Yeah, so let's think about it in this way, right? Do type systems allow us to <coughs> write programs we could never write before? No. Do they allow us to be more expressive and to create better, interesting programs that we could never do before? No. They're actually restrictive. They're actually restrictive, right? Yeah, if you think about it, right, a program type systems are actually confining you, right? They're limiting the amount of possible programs you can write in that language. And then you may have to fight with that type system by using casting Right? to say, no, no, I know what I'm doing here type system, trust me. Yeah. Sort of just like to make more sense of what you write, because it wouldn't make sense to like add five to the letter S, like who would do that? But yeah, so there, there is an amount sense. of productivity to, that type <laughs> systems gives you because we aren't computers and we, we can't process the raw data like the way, like, Yes, if you didn't have a type
API system, you could create like some kind of goober program that that could convert from like a void pointer to like a double or something oh. ridiculous. But why? <laughs> why? Yes, why indeed. Uh, yeah, so I think you all are kind of saying very similar things, right? So the, the type system confines us, right? But it's there to help us also to help, essentially help document our code, right? So that we can say, hey, okay, we know <coughs> to the computer, right, at the bottom everything is in ones and zeros. Right? But if we just had to deal with those ones and zeros to program, it would be a little bit crazy. So we want to do some abstractions like, hey, even though, so I'm treating this thing as a character, right? which even though I know the computer is going to store as ones and zeros, I want to treat it as if it is an abstract character. right? And so that way I want the compiler to stop me if I ever try to add a character and a double, right? because that doesn't make sense. So we can think about, so kind of informally, uh, we can say that, well, a type is some set of values and some operations that can be applied to those values. right? So we can say, OK, an integer is all numbers from, ooh, uh, let's go with unsigned ints. That's easier. 0 to 2 to the 32. Right? Every number in there could possibly be represented. And what are some operations that we can apply on the integer type? Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Yeah, addition, subtraction, multiplication. And right, so types exist externally of our program, right? But when we want to use them in our program, we have to so somehow associate and communicate this to the compiler. Hey, this variable has this type. Right? Or this constant has this type. And so, right? So these aren't just these values of types, right? Are not necessarily just numeric types, right? We have types for functions. We have a way to specify the type of a function. And so we're gonna be thinking about kind of type. Sorry. Uh, we're gonna be thinking about type systems. So we're gonna be thinking about, okay. What are all the things that go into creating a type system, and what are all the different ways we can do this, and how does that trade-off affect the programmer and the compiler? Uh, right. So every type system has basic types. Right. You have to have some building blocks. Everything. Um, right. So what are some of the basic types of like, let's say, C? Int. Int. Star. Character, float, double, long, boolean. So then, what else do we need? As we, the program, as us programmers, can we just use basic types and we say, "Hey, we've got basic types. We're totally good." Not really. It's not convenient. It's not convenient. So then, the type system would, let's say, more get in your way than. Not more so than it's worth, yeah. More so than it's worth, yeah. So what else do we need <coughs> beyond <coughs> basic types? Structs or objects or something. What like are structs and objects? Programmer created types. They're basically custom types. Yes. Say that again. Programmer created types. Yeah. So they're they allow the programmer to construct new types, right? They allow us to say like a struct says, "Hey, I'm going to create a new type, and that type is." Uh, a combination of two types. The first type is an integer, and the second type is a character, right? And so we need some way to allow the programmers to use these basic types to construct new interesting types. And this is really what gets. This is really where a lot of the power comes from, right? Is if we just allowed the programmers basic types, it'd be way too restricting, right? People would say this is stupid. I don't want to use this. But if we allow the programmers to create their own types, now we have something that's much more powerful. We call them <coughs> complex types. Uh, no. I mean, they're they're. I guess the only thing is they're non-basic types. Um, what's type inference? What does that mean? How does the compiler know what the types of your variables are? 
in C. Because you explicitly say what type they are? Yeah, you explicitly tell them exactly what types everything are. Is that cool? Do you like that? Yeah. Yes. It's nice yeah. six months later when you're trying to figure out your code. Mm, it's it's nice. inconvenient at the time. Yeah, what about trying to make a change to some code? Have you ever gotten a situation where you use, let's say, I don't know, an integer, and at some point you realize, oh man, this should really be a double? So then you have to go through, change that variable type to a double. Then you have to change everywhere that type is used later on. If it's passed into other functions, right, you have to change all of that to a double. What are you doing in project four? Magic. Magic. You're doing magic in type project four. I like that. Yeah, you're doing type checking, but do you have to specify the types of variables? No. You can, right? You can, but you don't have to. Right? But before, let's say, so we're not actually executing that program, but before you execute that program, does your compiler know all the types of all the variables in that program? Before? No. Before you execute it? No. It can figure it out at compile time. Yeah, right? That's what exactly what you're doing is figuring out what are the types of all variables in this program, right? Even the implicitly declared types and implicit variables you're figuring out based on their usage, you're inferring what those types are, and you're doing it beforehand, right? Whereas a language like Python doesn't do any static checking of types, but it does check at runtime. You can't call a function of an object that doesn't exist. So it will check at runtime, but what you're doing is you're inferring the types based on the usage. So to me, this actually is an incredibly powerful idea that you, um, that we'll see how it's done, but that you get the power of static typing without the necessity of always specifying exactly what every type is. Because the compiler can be smart enough to figure it out, and it can be so smart that you can ask it, hey, what's the type of this variable? You can just hover over it in some languages, and it'll say, hey, this is this type, yeah. So C sharp, yes, has the var keyword. Uh, there's var and auto, right, I think? Or auto, I think, is the dynamic typing, which basically you get rid of all the types, the static type checking. And var, var does, definitely does some inference. So it, depending on its usage right there, will infer. Uh, the type of inference we're talking about can be much more complex, it can infer types of functions based on usage and types of variables based on what they're passed to functions and we'll actually uh, try to solve the constraints to figure out, hey, uh, what, type, what type does this variable have to have in order for it to actually compile? Uh, so can it be a list of any type or does it have to be a list of integers for some, for some reason? Okay. So what do we also need? So is this all we need? So if we do all this, is this it? Are we good? Type, types solved? We have a type system? Casting types? Casting types. Yeah. Um, so why do you need to cast types, though? Because, what are you trying to do when you cast a type? Convert it to a different type. Convert it to a different type to do what? <coughs> For quick use. For quick use? Yes. Take up a different amount of memory. Wait, just a second. Yeah? Take up a different amount of memory. Take up different amounts of memory. Kind of. I mean, when you cast it, you're telling the compiler to treat it as if it only used a different amount of memory, but it actually still used the larger amount. Yeah. Wouldn't you want to cast something if you want to perform a certain operation on that that you can only perform on the type that you're casting to? Like if I had an in int and I wanted to um, cast it to a char so I could only do something that I could do on a char, I would have to do that cast. Right. 
Right, so it's because, right, so the main idea is how do we know when two types are equal? Right, we have to have some way, our type system needs to specify when are types compatible, when can they be, um, when they can be, they be used one for the other, right? And what are the rules? So if I have two different structures, right, can they be the same? Do I need to explicitly cast them? Or can the compiler say, hey, based on the type system, these two types are the same, and I can treat them the same, right? And so that's really the third aspect of the type system. Um, so we need to have, in order to have um, create new types, right, we have to have the ability to declare types. Um, so the programming language, right, as we saw, is going to include basic types, as we've seen. And so this way, basic types, right, are included in a language, and they're available to any program that's written in that language. But we also need some kind of type constructors, right? We need a way for programmers to construct and create new, complex, interesting types. So what kind of type constructors do we have that you've used? Structs. What is a struct from a type perspective? Data structure. Contiguously allocated memory. Ooh, contiguously allocated memory. Uh, let's not think about memory. We're thinking at a higher level about types, right? Without thinking about the kind of hardware or how it's custom allocated. Custom type. What was that? They're custom types. They are custom types, but how do you create them? Structure is one. Code them. Yes, but what do you use? How do you? What are the different types of types? Your name struct. Yeah, struct is one. Q. A what? Q. I can't. A Q. A Q. Ah, uh, 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 a Q. Uh, so that would be in like C I think they have a Q class in other languages. So how are arrays created? So how are strings represented in C? Array of characters. What's the type of an array of characters? Is there is array a basic type in C? No. 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 So it's a pointer to. A it's character. a character pointer, right? right? And so by doing that, we've actually created a new type, right? We've said, okay, from the basic type character, we can create a pointer to a character, a character star. And we can actually keep doing that, right? You can have pointers to character pointers, and you can have pointers to pointers to pointers to character pointers, and you can have pointers to 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 character pointers, right? And we already just went over all of how to visualize that and understand what's going on there, so you're all experts at pointers. And so the nice thing is we can create with at this type constructor, you know, we're calling it pointer to T for any type T, any basic type or any type. So any type constructor. So we can have pointers to structs. Okay. So we talked about structs, right? So what are the defining features of a struct, type-wise? <coughs> Field in the struct has to have a name <coughs> type. and a type, right? Each of those fields has to have a type. So this is how we're going to represent. So what we're doing right now is creating kind of like an abstract um, type system. So we're going to say, so we have pointers to things. Uh, we have a structure, right? So in this, we're going to say all the A's here are field names and all the T's are types, right? And so we have to have previously defined types. So what if we want to have arrays in our language and we want to allow those as a, as a type constructor? What would, we, what would we use? From a type perspective, what's some of the types that have to have, that an array has to have or could have? 
pointer. Well, let's say we're not going to use pointers. We're going to create a new way, a way for programmers to create their own arrays. Just like with structs, right? We have a way for programmers to create their own structure. Field is an element of the array. Well, there's an index associated with to a name that's declared for that array. Yes. So with arrays, right, we need indexes. All right, so what do we need about the type of the arrays? Consistent. Right? They should be consistent, right? So every element in the array should have the same type. Um, what if what if we want to specify the range, right? So this type is an array of zero to ten or 10, right? That could actually give us, would this be nice as programmers and as compiler writers? Easy to navigate, I guess. Yeah. Definitely a little bit better, right? Because we have the range, we can specify, we can know beforehand exactly how many elements are gonna be in this array. And so array, this range, we're gonna say it can be either single dimensional, right, for one, or we can do multi-dimensional arrays like this. So we can have an n by m array. So what about for functions? What are the types of functions? And what's important on the types for functions? Return type. Return type? What else? Parameters. Types. What, what, was it, what about parameters? The types of parameters. The types of parameters. What else about parameters? The what? Number. The number, yeah, the number of parameters, right? So we're gonna say we can create new function types by a function that has k parameters and returns something of type t, right? Where all of these t, t1, t2, tk, they're all independent, right? They can all be independent things. Okay, so the type of this is a function and the types of the parameters are t1 to tk and the return type is t. Okay, so we need some way to actually use these type constructors. And so very similar to project four, we're gonna use kind of these, um, uh, these ways to do type constructors. So we're going to uh, declare types. So we're gonna declare that this new type, CM for centimeter, is an integer. We can define RGBA as an array from zero to four of integers. So what's RGBA? Seen it before? Yeah, red, green, red, green, blue, alpha, right? Which is used for restoring like pixel data format. So red, blue, green is the amount of red, blue, uh, red, green, or blue in that pixel, and then the alpha is the uh, transparency, yeah, of that pixel. And so we can say that well, we can make a PNG. Right, or some kind of image, an array of RGBAs. Right, so we're building, we're constructing new types based on the other types that we've already declared. So, uh, do types need names? Well, they need a distinguisher. Because otherwise, how do you tell one from another? Or rather, how does the compiler tell one from another? Mm. That is a very good question, and we're going to get to that, right? That's from the type compatibility rules. So we'll see later how we define that, right? So let's look at this struct. So have you ever wondered why in C, when you write a struct, it has to end in a semicolon? No, I just do it. Huh? No, I just do it. No, you just do it? But like it doesn't make any sense because functions don't end in semicolons, right? It's a very similar structure. What's the name, right? The name? Isn't that like this? Because it's like when, when you when you say struct and A B and then you end the structure and you put the Y. Oh, uh, you put the name here. Right? Struct foo. Yeah. And then you can put Y at the bottom, right? That's not the name though. Y is not the name. What is it? So what you're doing here actually is you're declaring a variable y 
and the type of y has this type is a struct with a field int a and the second field character b. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly. Gonna create, it's going to create a new variable. Like It'll create a new variable, exactly. But note that in this case, this structure has no name. Okay. Right? There's no name for this structure. It's what we call an anonymous type. I thought y was kind of its name. Y is a variable that has the type struct int a character b. Can't you make y into foo? What? Where's foo? <coughs> you can make y foo. Never mind. You can call it y whatever you want. It's just the name of the variable that has the type. Exactly. And the important point is this is not the type. This is not the structure, right? This is the variable y that has that type. So you can't create new variables with new types of y because y is a variable. Similarly, we could say here that we can have an array of 0 to 4, right? So we can change. Oh, yeah. So here we're, we're declaring a variable x, and the type of x is an array 0 to 4 of int, right? So array 0 to 4 int of integers. This type has no name, right? We didn't declare that this type is a PNG or an RGBA. Right? So now one of the big questions is, if I have this x, right, and I have another variable that is of type RGBA, can I assign one type to the other? Can I assign foo to x or x to foo? If they allow it, yes. And the big question is, how do we do that? And how do we make sure that it's actually what we want it to do? Does everybody see the anonymous type rules? And actually, yeah. Um, okay, so if you did have a name for that struct, mm -hmm. if you wanted to later on refer to it, you would need to specifically say struct and then that name, and then, but for y, you could just call y. Okay, yes. Actually, that's great. Let's look same at the same variable y. It'd be just like having two variables with the same name. It would throw an error if they're in the same scope. But you can't you change the name on each struct, then you just. Just a second, just a second. Let's, uh, let's look at it real quick. Okay. Okay, we're going to demystify structs. Okay. Uh, does it really matter what these are? No. Okay, so right here, this is perfectly legal. You can use this in your program. There's just an anonymous struct. Actually, I don't know if it's actually legal, but we could check. Um, but, so usually when we use this, let's say this is struct test, right? So structure test. So now if we want to say somewhere else in our program, right, if we want to use this type, how would I declare that I have a variable, let's call it x, of this type? Right, so we're saying that x is a struct that's test, and we know that test is that type. Okay. Right. So this means, so what this means, this is declaring a variable y in the global scope that has the type of a struct with an int foo and a character bar. So can I say y equals, I don't know, so can I declare a struct y called as? No. no, because y is a variable, right? But I can do things like I can say, I can say y.foo is equal to 100, right? And that's perfectly legal. Yeah? So I know for the x and you didn't um, allocate memory, but I'm just curious, in the case of the y struct, it was just inherently a memory like that on the back mm. Ah, so where, what's the scope of this variable? Why? Global. So then what's the allocation? Global. Global allocation. Right? And this variable x is declared where? On the stack. So it's automatically stack allocated. So that's why there's automatically memory for that variable, that structure x. Cool. All right. So let, then let's look at one more example. So maybe you've seen this.
usually sometimes you have to name it, but uh, we'll start. We'll call it test two. So what's this doing? So what what is the type what is the type def in C? It lets you use instead of struct test two, you can just say test two. And yeah. So here instead of type def, so instead of using every time you use a centimeter, it's the same thing as using an integer, right? This is exactly what this type def line does. So then here, I can actually remove this. So here I'm saying define test two, right? From here on out, anytime I use test two, I want it to be this, excuse me, this structure, this anonymous structure foo bar. So that in here. So you just type less code. Yeah. Or Z, right? So here I'm defining the structure without using the struct. So this is why if you see, if you've ever been confused as to you're looking at code and like sometimes you have to declare the struct, right, when using that type, other times you don't. You don't have to declare it if you use a type def. So this is why people usually do that because it saves less code. Is this just to a variable there then? So how can I uh, yeah, the syntax. Uh oh. Uh, I think it still works. I mean, we can look at maybe the example code real quick. You have to name it. I think you. No, you don't have to name it. Um, I think because it's in a type def, it's fine. Like the syntax is different for a type def than a struct definition exactly. But uh, I actually don't know 100%. What's um? Here, ah, so here's one example, right? So we're using, we're declaring enum, right, an expression type in this example as either a primary expression, a no-op, or an assignment. And because we use this type def, we don't always have to say enum expression type, right? We can just say expression type. Um, actually, so it's not like a variable; it's just a name of it. Yes, exactly. The type def means define this new type as that new name. Let's uh, quickly try something. So you can still name it? Yes. And then, OK, so the other super tricky thing, if you're trying to do a um, recursive struct, uh, so let's say I wanted to create this new node type structure. And so I wanted a pointer to itself or some next node, right? So making a linked list with a struct. Is this going to compile? No. no. Why not? <coughs> we need to declare so, it's not defined yet. Yeah, so the problem is the node type is not defined yet. Node type is not defined yet inside this struct. Right? It's only defined after this definition. Uh, this is why when you do this, if you want to do it like this, you have to do, so you either have two options. You either just don't use that type def and you say uh, struct node, and you'd say int foo, and then you'd say uh, struct node pointer next. You either have to do it like this, or you'd have to change this You'd have to define this structure as a struct, a node structure, and here you'd have to say struct foo. But then later on, you can define uh, some node uh, testing, and then you can say testing dot next is equal to whatever you want. Um, so, anyways, hopefully this helps when you're looking at code to understand what's going on. Cool. All right. Thanks for bearing with me.